Namaste. So this chapter 14 is really something. I hesitated a bit before making this um, insights video because there's just so much in it. The problem was how to uh, omit so much material and really just talk on the highlights. Because I could make a whole video series out of this one chapter. There's so much good stuff in it. So if you haven't watched it, go watch it now. Otherwise, you won't have any idea what I'm talking about because I'm just going to hit the high points. I've highlighted uh, several passages and the first is from the first paragraph. Vasudeva is the absolute Brahman. Okay, she has said that so many times. He represents Brahman in the Vaishnava system, just like uh, Shiva represents Brahman, Nirguna Brahman, in the Shaivite system. They're just two different systems, two different metaphors, talking about the same thing. The actual reality, when you realize it, is completely, <laughs> how can I say, uh, beyond name and form. So <clears throat> these names and forms like Shiva, Vasudev, Narayana, Shakti, all these things are metaphors because when you actually realize them, there's no name and form. It's beyond name and form. It's transcendental. And she supports this in the next phrase where she says, consciousness consisting of myself evolves into both sentient and insentient objects. Absolutely pure and sovereign consciousness is indeed my real form. So, you know, when people worship Lakshmi here in India, it's actually kind of pathetic because they reduce her to an idol. Just, just a form, you know, and they do all kinds of puja and they expect to receive material wealth in return. It's a business deal. Here, I'll do a little puja for you and now you give me money, give me money. It's kind of actually mm, disgusting because she is so much more than that and she can give so much more than that. Any material wealth, I don't care whether it's money, land, houses, power, beauty, knowledge, renunciation, what have you, is perishable. It will go away. And if not before, it will certainly go away at the time of death. Huh? And all that stuff is finished. Why should we ask the imperishable, absolute goddess for something perishable? You see? It doesn't make sense, you know, if you think about it for a minute. The problem is people are just greedy and they want stuff. And so they approach her with trivial desires. And guess what? She grants their desires. But then she also grants rebirth in the material world. So, you know, you get exactly what you ask for. It's just that people don't realize the consequences. So <laughs> those who worship Lakshmi as simply a provider of wealth are actually fooling themselves, they're cheating themselves. When they could get so much more, they could get wealth from her that does not deteriorate, huh? that lasts beyond the moment of death. They could get the greatest knowledge, which is self-realization. Anyway, let's go on, there's a lot to cover. Then she talks about polarized thinking, aware of objects such as blue, yellow, happiness, sorrow, etc., distinguishes undifferentiated pure consciousness by its variegated wealth of limiting conditions. 
Polarized consciousness means duality. It means distinguishing the subject, the object, and the perception. Uh, it actually, duality is funny. It, it isn't really two, it's three. It's the perceiver, the perceived, and the perception. So polarized consciousness means this ontological triple that we call an existence or thisness. Huh? If you go back to our videos on vortex theory, you will find that Buddha defines a vortex as a triplicity, which is a thisness. In other words, it's a break in the flow of natural energy. And the break is caused by ego. Ego distinguishes I as an individual self. Although there is no such thing in reality, it becomes a block in the flow of cosmic energy and causes eddies and whirlpools. And these are vortexes. So the vortex, the existence of the vortex is a triple that allows us to say, this is a thing. And that's thisness. So she's talking about that. To go on. That self of mine, which is beyond all polarized knowledge, free from the taint of words and unaffected by any limiting condition, undergoes evolution in the form of perceptible material objects. When the mind is free from polarized thought, these perceptible material objects that attain the madhyama vritti, middle mode, become identified with consciousness. In other words, we're not concerned anymore in self-realization, in meditation. We cast off the limiting adjuncts, the upadis, and the other forms of conditioning that apply to the dualistic or triplistic <laughs> consciousness, the mundane consciousness. And then we arrive at pure consciousness, which has neither subject nor object, but includes both. See, without making a distinction between them. And then this is the real consciousness. And when one realizes, you know it, when you, when you get it, because it's so blissful. And she'll go on about that too. Then she says something really profound. When the object is related to cognition by the knower, cognizer, and he reflects upon it, it is then myself, consisting of knowledge and ever revealed, who is in fact perceived as that object. This is huge. This is great. In fact, it reminds me of some things that Ramana Maharshi has said. When people doubted the existence of the self, he would say, well, do you exist? And he would say, well, of course I exist. <laughs> and he'd say, how do you know? And they were like, uh, well, or, um. the fact is consciousness can be aware of itself. And there's no subject object distinction because there's no difference between the perceiver and the perceived. See, the cognition and the cognizer. When that happens, then we are aware of her. Goddess Lakshmi as pure consciousness. See, so really, I mean, it's so amazing to me this chapter, if you simply take out the I and myself and you replace it with the self, you basically have Ramana Maharshi's teaching in a nutshell. This is so amazing. I was just talking with a friend of mine over lunch about this, and he was amazed he, because he, he was an Indian guy. And he had only encountered worship, you know, the very materialistic type of worship of Lakshmi. Not Lakshmi as a metaphor for the self, universal consciousness. 
So he was very surprised to hear this. <laughs> and I was very happy to be able to reveal it to him. But anyway, when we enter into a state of non-dual consciousness, this is realization of Shakti. She says, I am ever realized. Just like Ramana would say, the fact that you are aware that you exist, that you are conscious, means the self is already realized. You don't have to go in a cave or, you know, beat yourself up or whatever people do. You, you can realize that consciousness in everyday life just by understanding that the objects that are perceived are the same as the consciousness that perceives them. Boing. Then she says, when in the ocean of consciousness, the only foothold left on the flooded island is the term connoting idangpada, this, and perceptible material objects are almost submerged, I then provide them with a support to hold on to. Those whose vasana impressions have all been washed away, removed by the nectar-like flow of meditation upon me, realize me, who am pure consciousness, engulfing the multitudinous variety of objects as identical with themselves. Whew. What a heavy statement. So in other words, you go into meditation and by removing the attention from the senses, all the sense objects disappear. <clears throat> it's like being on an island and gradually the tide is coming in and covering everything on the island until there's almost nothing left. Only the cognition of I, I-hood, ahamtwa, or egoity, the fact that I am. At this point, she gives herself to hold on to. And what is herself? It is that very non-dual consciousness. See, we started going into this very early in our series on the golden flower. The secret of the golden flower basically teaches this, to be aware of oneself as consciousness, because consciousness is really all there is. And everything we perceive is actually consciousness. We don't perceive things directly. We perceive only the impressions received through the senses. So what we perceive depends on the quality of our senses and so forth. What we really are perceiving is nothing but projections based on our own consciousness. So when we project our consciousness outward through the senses, we see the world. And when we turn it inward toward the self, then we see her, the self, the unconditioned consciousness. I manifest myself in the true presentation of myself to those who are able to discern me with a calm mind devoid of polarized experience, even in the waking state. So you don't have to be sitting in a cave to realize this. You can realize this in the middle of ordinary activities. You just have to realize that she is consciousness and that everything we perceive is consciousness. Therefore, everything we perceive is her, including our own self. Therefore, even when perceived by those who seek to know me while still influenced by polarization, I make them forget me. So in other words, the people who approach Goddess Lakshmi with a dualistic concept, she, she does the Jedi mind trick and you know, makes them forget her. <laughs> So they can't remember her in all situations. Why? Because they're not identifying her with consciousness, with the self, with a capital S. 
Just as a person desirous of understanding some particular object stills every other movement of his mind and through deep concentration grasps it immediately, similarly, even during empirical existence, pure-souled persons realize my ever-manifest and sovereign self embodying pure knowledge. So here she gets into how to realize her even in the flow of contradictory impressions in the world. Although in essence I am pure and independent, still after assuming one form and then passing on to another, I retain my pure nature during the intermediate state. So in other words, as our attention passes from one object to another, in the gaps in between, that's her in her pure state. It reminds me of when Osho Rajneesh used to say, what I'm saying is not important. What's in the gaps between the words? What's in the gaps between the thoughts? That's silence. That's the important thing. Even while undergoing all these modifications, I revert to my essential form in every intermediate state between two successive modifications. Thus, each modification is directly linked with my essential form. So you see, there's no need to forget her, even when our attention is caught up in the world of apparently separate objects. When we remember that she is the consciousness that ties it all together, and in the interval between our perceiving one object and perceiving the next object, she is always in her pure and pristine state. And I just want to leave you with one more, I know I'm over time, but this one nugget is so good. <laughs> Listen to this. My true state of existence, illuminated by Agni and Soma, manifests itself as Padam, my abode in the Sushumna, when passage through the Ida and Pingala is checked. Whoa. Agni means the sacred fire, and Soma means the psychedelic nectar that is produced by offering certain herbs. We don't know what they were, unfortunately. The recipe's been lost. But in the old days, they would have these sacrifices, great sacrifices that would go on for days, and all the people would be invited. They were sponsored by the kings, and performed by the great sages and brahmanas. And so in the sacrifice, the soma would be prepared and offered to the god and goddess, and then distributed amongst people, and it's written that they would be able to see the gods. So through Agni and Soma, then she can be realized in her pristine state. You see, as I go through this Lakshmi Tantra, I get, I get blown away at almost every chapter by some new revelation that actually confirms and supports kind of everything I've been through in my life. It's just amazing. And the breadth of her vision and description of herself leads to, I mean, such a deep understanding of actually the whole universe that it's really astounding why the modern scientists and philosophers haven't picked up on this, why they don't use it as a framework for scientific exploration, because it would be such a rich source of uh, theories that could be tested by experiments. But, you know, they have this bias, they have this prejudice, they have this uh, uh, very critical vision toward the scriptures, uh, only because their Western scriptures are so completely off. <laughs> so they miss the whole thing. 
So just one more little nugget here. Totally unattached eye consciousness revealed in the mind of the adept who completely renounces all craving for objects and whose mind delights in devotion to me is indeed my true body. Not some idol in a temple somewhere. Not some picture of her, you know, distributing gold coins to everybody. No, that's not her true form. Her true form is that consciousness which is divorced from identification with all objects and which is saturated with bhakti, huh? devotional love, and which has no subject and object distinctions. This is her true form. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum.